Right, let's, can, can I invite you and Claire and Bridget to turn your cameras on and we will have a discussion and we'll look at some of the questions. So we've started getting some questions in the chat. We'll start off, I think, and hopefully we'll, we'll get more for you attendees. Um, have a moment to cogitate and digest and then get your questions into that Q&A. Um, we had, I'm just going to go to one that um, Claire had typed, but I'm just going to ask this one. Uh, one of you had asked, Claire, did I hear that right in your case study? Did you say that the comparison between a traditional face-to-face -face meetup had 99% less environmental impact than an online one? Um, sorry, can you clarify? Thanks, Claire. Sure. Um, um, I hope I didn't say it wrong in the presentation. Don't worry. <laughs> confusing people. Um, yes. So what they did, um, basically, um, the National Arts Centre um, got somebody to look at these three different types of ways of doing a meeting. And they saw that the online meeting was basically 99% less emissions than um, doing a traditional conference with people coming involving long haul travel, because it's an event in Canada, which is such a huge country and people coming and um, flying. Um, so, so the online version was way, way, way less impactful looking only at the carbon emission impact, um, it has to be said. And I put the link um, in, the, in the response because the National Arts Centre made all of that information available, um, which I think is, was a really great thing to do as well. Fantastic, thank you. We'll share that link um, with the follow-up along with all of the other links. Um, and, You've got you've got people's practical brains going, Claire. <laughs> so another practical one. Um, what would some key questions for system providers be, for example, when setting up a digital project to ensure low impact? That's from Tina. Um, so I think um <clears throat> we maybe just to say we've been working um with the space recently who do um who commission digital art projects and we've had some really interesting conversations with the group and um, first and foremost um you know they're looking at a whole range of digital artworks and really fantastically nearly every single project has an environmental focus it's about engaging people environmentally so that was really interesting to see and then we had some discussion about you know what they should be thinking about um and what to you know what to ask of service providers and honestly i think um the first key thing is to ask what are their own environmental commitments um and you'll be able to get a sense hopefully easily enough if they don't know how to respond or spend ages going, uh, I'm not sure I'll put you in contact with somebody or if they just give you like a standard view, like tick box approaches, but ask, 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 ask what their commitments are, ask what they can do to help you understand and take action to reduce the impacts of that digital project um, and ask them if they can, you know, also help to to look at um to help with some monitoring and evaluation of that digital project as well if especially you know if it has environmental engagement at the heart of it um so and 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 then on a more practical level ask what they um two things is ask about their own um energy sourcing for if it's um like a cloud service or um um a, a uh, uh, websites hosting, for example, what is their energy source and what can they do to make the digital design lighter? Um, because lighter will mean generally more energy efficient. So two more practical things to ask. Brilliant, thank you. Did Bridget or Richie, did you want to jump in on that one? Any thoughts? I think Claire's covered that beautifully. Thank you, Claire. Um, right, we're still on questions. The next one um, 
its questions, but from a different angle. So this uh, participant has asked so much to think about, so much to learn and change about the way we do things as leaders, that it can often feel a bit overwhelming, as, as Rajir said. Where should we start? So if it is about, as Rishi has said, to asking the right questions, can the speakers say what they think those top questions might be? So who wants to dive in? Bridget, you've unmuted yourself. Thank you. <laughs> yes, I will dive in. Um, this might repeat what I said earlier, but I think maybe it sums it up. The key questions are enormous ones. They're big ones. Um, they're also... There is also in here an emotional question referring to what Rashir was talking about. So how will the earth crisis affect the continuity of our business, our work and facing the radical uncertainty of that? You know, how can we face that? <laughs> what does this crisis mean for our fundamental purpose? How does our engagement with people through digital channels contribute to shifting mindsets and behaviours to more regenerative ways? And this is the hard one. How do I, as an individual, manage if the institution isn't ready for that transformation or to really um, deal with those questions? And then how can I form community and collaborate to achieve truth telling and action for justice in my own work and life and, you know, to achieve that kind of change in the institution? So, yeah. Yeah. Nothing more to say. <laughs> Sorry, couldn't unmute myself for a moment. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Bridget. Same question to Richard. Let's see. I suppose I would split it into two classes of questions. This is the strategic questions. I think like Bridget mentioned, you know, you know, why am I, what am I hoping to get out of this journey? Who am I speaking to? Um, you know, how do I know that this will have a positive impact on equality, you know, all those different things. How can I make sure this is human centric and people focused? Um, but then there are also the very, very practical questions that you can, you know, uh, for example, when you go on a search engine, you're trying to find out about a particular digital approach or you're trying to understand how you might achieve a particular aim. Um, how you what you actually ask and how you phrase it will give you a very different type of answer. And will lead you around a different path and it might not necessarily be the right answer or the wrong answer but it'll take you down a particular direction and so what you ask is in many cases much more important these days i'd say than uh, what the answers are even i know that sounds a bit weird doesn't it but it, it's true i mean you know anyone that goes in a if you use a search engine or if you go and ask a consultant or if you go and ask your, your colleagues or ask a question in a conference how you frame your question uh, sets the agenda and tone for what the, what's to follow and where your energies go. So I, I so I think there's a practical element as well as the strategic element to uh, the kind of questions you can ask. Thank you so much, Claire. Um, I I I think just just um, to add, um, I think <laughs> with um, environmental. Um, action, it can feel quite overwhelming. Um, and then you've got digital, environmental, where do I start? I, I, I do one thing that we do quite often with organizations is try and start with a particular project or activity where you can get some learning also and say, you know, for example, the work we did with the space commissions, it's like, okay, you've got um, a particular project or a particular activity and start with that um, and get, um, you know, start asking questions and, and put it in, a, you know, a bite-sized chunk and then you will get some learning from that. Um, I think that was also the experience very much we had with the Earth Speaker Project. Um, a lot of the work of Oliver Lyson is very, very environmentally focused but they really wanted to better understand the environmental impacts of it. And doing that one project in particular was really helpful um, to inform um, their thinking going forward. So if you are feeling overwhelmed, you know, how do you eat an elephant? You know, take, take a piece of something that you feel is more manageable. Start with that, but make sure that you take the learnings from it across other activities. 
Thank you, Claire. And just to pick up on what Bridget was saying about building community and that sense that is so important, I just wondered if Richie and Claire, has that been something that you have found you know, that's part of your practice and that helps you personally deal with this as, as leaders in the sector and any tips around how you do that? Who wants to go? Richie. Okay, is it who unmutes first? <laughs> right. Um, yeah, I suppose uh, community is really key for uh, and for um, particularly the digital sphere. We can now set up forums, and uh, um, one of the things that we've done in the Scottish Wildlife Trust is we've um, worked with others to host the Scottish Nature Finance Pioneers Network. Now, Nature Finance is a huge agenda, billions at stake, and. Uh, uh, lots of money pouring in, you know, all, all the the um, corporates are now trying to, uh, and there's dangers of greenwashing behind and everything else. So it's a huge area. It can be very overwhelming. By setting up a forum and a network uh, around what we're calling Nature Finance Pioneers in Scotland, we have around 316 people part of the network now, right across sectors and, and backgrounds and so on. Uh, for me, uh, it means that I don't now need to go and read lots and lots of reports all the time because people come forward and, and things get surfaced through the network. It's a huge time saver. And it's also a very effective way of building new partnerships and collaborations and seeing what different people are doing out there. Um, so community is absolutely critical and crucial. I mean, a community both in the community of practice sense, but also communities in terms of the local community sense as well, I would say, because one of the things certainly in Scotland uh, that we're quite aware of is uh, the um, the community land issue and people's participation in some of these agendas and things being done to communities and so on and and diversity within communities and all of those those aspects. And I think all of that is kind of tied very closely here to digital as well. Also bearing in mind the, the dangers of digital in dividing communities as well and digital exclusion and digital divides and so on as well. Um, yeah, um, uh, a few things uh, to add in terms of uh, community. Um, I think what's been fantastic for us at Julie's Bicycle is that we, we've been building our community within the team because we now have um, a digital lead, someone who's come from the NGO world, who's worked in, you know, human rights um, areas, in environmental areas, and um, having that expertise and creating a small team around that and for us to have someone to help us understand the issues is has been wonderful so that's like our little community within the organization and um, we are also um really trying to work more with the community of people who use and access our digital content um, and finding out what they think and how they use it and what we can do better. So to be more collaborative. Um, what's been fantastic also is working with um, digital experts. Um, I have learned so much, for example, working with the University of Bristol. Um, they have some amazing experts on um, technology, digital and sustainability. So being able to connect with that and I think and hope that they also learned an awful lot um, about working with the creative and cultural worlds. Um, and I think what we are seeing also is a community of artists and creatives and cultural organizations. Interestingly, I would say a lot of the small ones who are doing some really interesting things like the Network Condition Project, which is a collaborative project and has led to all other kinds of collaborations. Um, so that community is, is really exciting. Um, and, you know, in the smaller organizations then have that ability sometimes to be more agile and more nimble and to take a bit more risk. Um, so I think there's different types of, of communities within um, our, what we're doing around digital. Thank you so much, Claire. Do you want to expand on that a little bit more, Bridget? I really, 
I don't know if if this is true or not at all, but the impression that I get sometimes that there can be that disconnect within that cultural um, sector umbrella, sometimes between arts and heritage. And part of the reason this this panel is so great is because we're bringing together arts and heritage organisations. I'm just wondering if kind of networks that community that you were talking about and just thinking about how our listeners who are primarily in heritage you know how they can any more tips on or sort of practical example how they can get involved in these communities Mm, I think I think that the heritage sector in particular has been maybe a bit more hierarchical you know there are bigger institutions um, than the arts it's not entirely true (laughs) but um but I do think that hierarchical structures can be um, immensely frustrating for, you know, it responsive change in a rapidly changing world. And I think that that's the kind of, you know, that's where people really need to, to, um, to, to start creating a greater sense of horizontality and and dialogue within institutions and if they can't then they have to kind of take it out you know and do it elsewhere and try and sort of um influence it from the outside so you know well I mean if you're not in it you know the museum's computer group um uh, sign up with culture declares you know because there are local hubs forming where you can connect with with other people who are um doing practical things together to reduce their footprints and uh, engage with audiences. So I don't know, it's, um, it's, it's I mean, it, I, I'm hoping you're going to ask the next question that Jane has asked about human focused approaches, because we can seek into that really. I absolutely was. Next one. So that's that's from Jane, our CEO here at Culture24, who's interested um, in the panel talking a bit more about the importance of the human centred approach to all of this. And I think her ears have picked up because we do take that approach at Culture24. Um, so she's excited to hear it talked about in terms of environmental impact. So, yeah, Bridget, do you want to do the segue? <laughs> yeah, yeah. So the segue. So I... Don't fo- I don't emphasize a human-centered approach. I am starting now to use the term pluricentric, which has been introduced by the IPBES. Uh, Rishi might know about this. It, they've produced this uh, report on how we assess the value of, of nature and heritage. So they've come up with these frames, and we need they say we need to move from being ecocentric, or we we've, we must move from being anthropocentric which is human centered to being um, not just ecocentric, but pluricentric, which is about acknowledging the multitude of life forms and how we're all interdependent and how um, um, and acknowledging, you know, the important role of nature connected people. Um, So being human centric is not just about within the narrow frames of how we see our own society and our own, you know, um, way of living we have to broaden and open out much more but you know within within that we can really only take action within our local places and within the human relationships we have so human centric sits inside being pluricentric yeah (laughs) fascinating absolutely fascinating and actually an idea that that I only first came across last week at the GEM conference, Group for Education and Museums conference, was having a chat with someone about it there. So it's, yeah, that idea of um, being pluricentric definitely coming through. Any thoughts, Rishi or Claire? Have you, Rishi? I quite like that, actually, uh, pluricentric. I think it makes a lot of sense. I think uh, we have to look at everything in context. And uh, I think it's very important to see Um, what what we're doing in digital through a human lens we need to look see that but we also need to look at what we're doing through digital through an environmental lens and through an economic lens and through a a planetary lens there's so many different ways in which we need to look at this and it's just different layers isn't it and trying to make sense of that can be quite difficult so uh, but I think if we look at it through these multiple angles I think the picture we build up like a hologram is so much richer so I completely agree I think with what Bridget has said 
I think um, um, the only thing that I would add on that, um, and it comes back to something Richard was saying earlier, is you know, we can't do digital without people. Um, you know, and like if all of the examples um, of the digital engagement initiatives I gave, they all involve people and ultimately um, in, engaging people in the co-design of um, digital engagement, I think is really important. It's something we're also trying to do. We saw it um, with, um, yeah, look, I guess, you know, the people who you want to reach and engage with need to be involved in that process, if you can, in the design process, and also finding out what difference it made to them. I think that's, you know, it's all about the people. Um, and, you know, also um, making sure that people who are leading on these projects have the skills and confidence to be able to, you know, not be experts, but at least, you know, feel confident in understanding what the issues are and being able to ask the right questions. I think that's really important. Yeah. I say that as somebody who has come on a long journey, uh, digitally speaking, over um, in particular, I'd say over the last few years. Yeah, thank you. That's such an important point about, especially around our leaders having that, having enough literacy. They don't have to, they don't have to understand the tech necessarily, but they need to have that understanding. It's 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 our responsibility as leaders now to have that understanding around around digital literacy. So just on a little bit related to that note, we've got a question um, from Beryl in the chat, but Rachir, which um, speaking to your wildlife trust work, I think, as someone who's concerned about animal welfare, how can I connect digital leadership and animal welfare? I think it's worth possibly clarifying that as a, <clears throat> as a wildlife trust, as a nature conservation charity, we're more concerned about habitat welfare so it's it's about habitats and biodiversity so um in within that we do we do have to take a management approach to particularly where there's non-native species involved and so on so it's not uh, just about animal welfare for us i think that that's one key distinction to make um i think in terms of the how you kind of connect it in with the approaches to supporting the welfare of wildlife um we have loads of examples on, on this, and I think it relates also to the question about the examples, what heritage organizations are doing around the environmental impact. Um, the digital explorer I've given goes into detail on this, but you'll look at you'll see examples there of, uh, in particular, citizen science, how we can work with people to be able to um, engage people in the monitoring and uh, assessment of uh, biodiversity. Also, uh, remote sensing technology, satellite observation. Uh, there's different ways in which uh, we can uh, organizations are pioneering and developing ways of using digital technologies in this space. But a lot of the most exciting ones do involve uh, what I would say is participation and engagement, um, either of the public or the wider scientific community um, or of practitioners or of other organizations in a collaborative and open way, particularly an open source way. I think that's where the really exciting potential lies. Thank you. And that is a perfect segue to a question I was going to ask Bridget. Bridget, you used the term radical commons earlier. Could you just expand on that a little bit more? What does that mean? Or what does it look like for heritage? Well, so <laughs> um, it's it's a kind of pluricentric approach, I guess, to data um currency uh um land um uh intellectual property um and cultural heritage which uh in is enabled by digital technology that um that is actually about transforming society transforming from you know a degenerative to a regenerative system by being radically open by creating commons of assets um that so so for heritage this would mean um being a part of some of these big kind of uh, investigations into or big experiments in in radically open data but with purpose you know really focused on on 
transformative impact you know the so how so in terms of the heritage sector it's not just about you know objects and specimens it's actually about how they might sit within landscapes and environments and and uh you know uh discourses about cultural ownership so that things can be restored you know back to <laughs> back to uh contexts where they can be useful and you know meaningful and have impact um in in place-based settings or in uh, i could go on about it um <laughs> it's 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 a whole other uh event perhaps <laughs> oh thank you you've opened it up anything um from the other two Michelle, claire on that notion of the commons the openness it might take us into that big question, as you said, Richard, around around examples. Yeah, I, I would just like to endorse that. I think, uh, and I think um, the National Lottery Heritage Fund have have uh, um, made a provision for the what they fund to be Creative Commons licensed, um, which I think is an excellent move. I think it, it kind of recognises the importance of uh, the, the 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 common knowledge that we we are generating together and building and iterating on together. And I think a lot of the most uh, advanced technologies right now in, in AI all the way through to, um, uh, you know, some of the blockchain work and everything else are all based on open creative commons type uh, approaches. Some of the, the most uh, powerful and pervasive platforms out there, such as, uh, you know, the Linux platform powers most of the devices that we all use. And, and, and so I think... Uh, it, it, it's it's a positive move, but it's something that's happening without a huge amount of fanfare. What you tend to hear in the media tends to be what the, the big um, technology companies are up to, which is can be quite, uh, you know, might not necessarily be very uh, positive towards privacy and all those kind of things. So people hear that side of the story, but the other side of the story is, is growing rapidly and uh, it's something which is worth engaging in, that creative commons approach. Yeah, um, just um, from our side, um, so the the tools um, which we provide, for example, the carbon calculators, they use open source um, software. Um, and now we, we have such huge interest in those tools and always organizations, people saying we'd like to do something with them. So we are we are looking now at how to make that more open source that it's um, that um, others can contribute to it can help to improve it and that we can make it available to others who want to go on without you know going no oh, that's ours so that um, that's a really really interesting not unchallenging process not very radical I would say though but definitely um, something. Um, that we are exploring and looking at how we can do that. Brilliant. Thank you very much. Um, there's something here. I have, I have a question for you around, um, around leading up. I've been quite interested in, as I said, this is the, the sixth of six sessions. And what has come through in some of the other ones, but hasn't really so far in this one, is... There's been sometimes um, a, either a sense of frustration or people voicing that they have challenges with um, the understanding, perhaps, or the confidence of boards and executive leadership when perhaps their literacies are not so strong, perhaps their understanding, their confidence. And we are talking about some quite, quite radical ideas and approaches here that we're talking about developing. I just wondered if you have any tips. Well, has that been an issue? Have you got any tips for, for how people listening, a lot of whom perhaps will be needing to spark change and build trust and build confidence in people above them in the organisation and perhaps their trustees? Bridget. <laughs> always ready with a comment aren't I um I want to point out that there's a bit of a transformation in boards in the larger institutions at the moment especially in England where uh, the government is replacing uh 
<clears throat> uh, board members with more extractive, more right wing, uh, less justice focused people. And this is a real problem. And staff and management, um, I think one of the solutions is for them to be more active in their unions and to get, I'm sorry, my notifications are pinging. I just muted them. Um, so, you know, I think this is a really significant um, political issue and we need to be more, more unionised. And I'm sorry, that's not really about digital leadership. It's part, of the, it's yeah. part of the picture, though. It's an important mm. part of the picture. Yeah. Yeah. Any thoughts from Richard? Yeah, I mean, I suppose uh, because of devolution, that's not quite as sharp in Scotland, maybe, as other you know, in some of the institutions in England. Um, in terms of uh, trustees and boards, um, I suppose one of the things I found is that uh, certainly in, 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 the, in the boards that I've engaged with, uh, there's a lot of positive intent coming through from board members. And I think that then gives an opportunity and opening for executives uh, to go and uh, bring to, to the board's attention um, you know, the, the new approaches, new ways of thinking, which can help them to uh, think through what they, they want to see and how they want to be custodians of the organisations that they're trustees of into the future. One of the things that uh, um, certainly in, the, in, 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 in Scottish Wildlife Trust Board, for example, we've got two uh, in equality, diversity and inclusion champions now on our board. Um, and uh, no, three, actually three, I think, if I've got that right. Uh, and uh, a mix of backgrounds, ages, personalities, skill sets, all of which is so important for this. And, and you know, it, I'm, I'm talking here about EDI, but the crossovers are very clear between ways in which you think around EDI and ways in which you start thinking differently about things like digital technology and so on. So um, I think uh, being responsive is probably a, a quite effective way of working with boards and trustees so that when when boards and trustees themselves are quite interested in in uh, trying out new ways of thinking um if you're really responsive to it it can just encourage that and it, and it can inspire them and, and it can create a nice positive cycle that's a really positive note i've just really it's 11 29 